Yeah, and uh, I hope you can see my screen. So today's topic is uh, to protect and secure your core banking APIs with Red Hat's API management. And in the agenda today, uh, we had uh, the concept of uh, core banking modernization, you know, the different architectural approaches that you could uh, take to modernize your core banking and make it more API centric. Uh, and then a look at uh, open APIs in action uh, and outside in view. And uh, hopefully uh, if Rafael can get back his uh, connectivity, we can do a demo. And then we thought we'll do a little segue into discussing how microservices will work in a uh, core banking uh, architecture. Uh, so looking at how you can use APIs and service mesh together, uh, how to uh, take care of your security when you're doing that, when you're, when you're developing with microservices and when you're protecting your APIs with API management. And finally, I wanted to do a short demo of showcasing the service mesh and uh, API management integration. So let me go into present mode. Yeah, so in terms of core banking modernization, right? So what is core banking, right? It is a backend system that process your complete daily banking transactions and post the updates to your accounts and to all the other financial records that are uh, part of the uh, whole uh, financial chain. Okay, so traditionally, banks used to have very tight control over this whole process, right? So all of the systems, uh, the data centers, the, uh, you know, the institutions that are partnering with the bank, uh, they all had a highly secure system to uh, connect with it. They had uh, to go through not just the uh, IT process, but even the location, the presence, where the banking is done, the bank had control, complete control over that. Now with uh, the customer centricity, with the distributed way of working, distributed way of uh, customer service, uh, all of that is now becoming more customer centric. The customer uh, expects everything to come to them. Bank needs to be accessible uh, through various means. Uh, branches are becoming a thing of the past now. Uh, they're, uh, uh, there are uh, offers uh, that banks are offering through uh, either online only, uh, uh, you know, vendors or through uh, multiple providers uh, that are that are having uh, presence uh, only in certain markets and certain segments. So the number of uh, customers they deal with, the number of uh, types of uh, partners they deal with, that is all uh, becoming uh, a lot more decentralized, which means the banking infrastructure needs to be uh, capable of uh, moving to that kind of a paradigm. Okay, so what are the areas of uh, core banking that we are talking about that need to be modernized? So they are your uh, legacy systems and the legacy system management, uh, you know, your regulatory compliances, your products and, you know, your channels that they have traditionally used for growth uh, and, uh, you know, the their uh, uh, their cost uh, cost benefit analysis that they need to do and then at the same time there are external challenges uh, like you know how how the ecosystems are evolving evol uh, evolving how your personalization needs to evolve uh, regulations are are be becoming even more uh, stricter in terms of uh, knowing your customer and in terms of uh, compliance and the time to market is now reduced to you know uh, to bring out the products into the market should be more agile rather than the slower pace that the banks are used to Okay, so and then with a more, more modular architecture, uh, from your current state of complex architecture uh, and outdated banking systems that uh, may be working on mainframes or maybe working on very old enterprise technologies to uh, bringing in a more streamlined architectures and uh, functions which are mostly provided, uh, you know, either jointly with, uh, with the vendors or uh, directly using systems that are vendor provided. Uh, using operational activities that could be performed directly by third party 
and uh, processing uh, using uh, things like uh, uh, automated uh, clearing systems or automated uh, you know um, uh, automated approvals and things like that using more intelligence in the IT process itself rather than depending on more traditional uh, you know uh, uh, manual approaches and longer processes that they used to run and also uh, the move towards a more open architecture uh, enabling this integration of modules uh, directly from the different service providers having that uh, integration point either as apis or as a, or as a event based uh, uh, mechanisms to be able to integrate uh, and operate as a single supply chain with services connected from third parties and uh, to uh, to provide the full automation of your uh, back office infrastructure okay and then so uh, so th those are the requirements that a bank has those are the uh, challenges uh, that are driving uh, banks towards taking uh, their architecture to a new uh, uh, to a new uh, and more modern uh, paradigm which means that uh, you know api management becomes a key for them to achieve success so uh, uh, what they need to do is uh, with uh, with the more customer centric approach and with an approach of uh, uh, designing their uh, uh, applications from the ground up uh, using a more traditional uh, more modern architectures like a microservice socket based architecture or using even streaming and even processing uh, you have uh, introduced new technologies like uh, a service mesh or a, a, a Kafka into the mix, and uh, and at the same time you are trying to provide uh, you know a, a solution that is cloud based, that is more modern, more scalable, and uh, your ability to do that uh, increases as you use API management to be able to provide that connectivity layer between your cons your consumers, your uh, developers of uh, your partners or your vendors. Uh, to directly access uh, APIs that you expose from your applications to be able to build that connectivity and build that single supply chain across uh, all the banking processes. So uh, uh, what we have uh, taken at Red Hat to uh, actually showcase uh, this kind of uh, a, a banking approach in action is to provide an open banking sandbox. Uh, so a, a unique uh, opinionated uh, approach uh, to open banking that uh, that has been created by the Red Hat Financial Services Vertical to showcase uh, what is possible when a, a bank moves to this uh, new uh, open architecture and adopts the open architecture paradigm to uh, build their uh, uh, applications and build their uh, business logic from the ground up. So it is based on the Red Hat OpenShift platform and the Red Hat integration portfolio of products. It is open sourced. It is prepackaged with a set of APIs that are implemented for certain open banking use cases. And it has a customized developer portal and a customized uh, a way of uh, you know, uh, providing self sign up for uh, users to get started. And this is uh, actually available for uh, partners uh, to, uh, to order and try out in their own premises uh, using an OpenShift cluster and uh, setting up this whole environment. Okay. Uh, so nextly, uh, in terms of uh, APIs and service mesh, right? So as you are uh, talking about uh, microservices and the microservice architecture, we are uh, going to talk about uh, you know how the service domain itself changes, right? So uh, in a in a traditional, more traditional architecture where uh, you know there was this uh, monolithic application that was handling all of the different uh, uh, domain specific expertise uh, and cross uh, cross cutting concerns uh, for your architecture. Uh, like your security, your logging, your testing, your uh, you know scalability, uh, your communication between the different services. With the microservice architecture, uh, you want to isolate the the service business logic 
from the associated uh, uh, you know meta information and from the associated uh, uh, connectivity patterns that you need to apply for uh, kind of for communication between the services and how these services are then exposed to different audiences whether they're internal or, or they're external so what you are building then is uh, you have a bounded service domain and uh, across it uh, would be your uh, uh, concerns like you know hey how do i ensure uh, availability for my service domain how do i uh, ensure reliability how do i ensure it scales well uh, how do I take care of the deployment options uh, uh, and testing options in a pipeline that are, that are separate from, uh, you know, the actual uh, uh, life cycle of a different service uh, that is developed by, you know, possibly for a different uh, business use case. At the same time, providing uh, the ability to discover, providing the ability to do observability and uh, communication across these services. But at the same time, uh, you know, as you are thinking about communication between the services and communication uh, through the services, the ability to reach out uh, to external audiences and the ability for external uh, consumers or developers to consume your APIs doesn't go away. So how do I expose my service as an API? Or how do I put my API management layer on top of my services? That becomes another key concern. Okay, and so uh, the question then becomes in this new architecture, where does API management belong and where does service mesh belong? So for us, API management, uh, the thing to remember is it manages the relationship between API uh, providers and API consumers. So the target users are uh, more uh, business centric users uh, and uh, what you are exposing as APIs are business constructs. Okay, so uh, you are trying to provide uh, an ecosystem for partners or for, uh, for your consumers to connect Connect with you, you would have to think about things like providing a developer portal, maybe monetizing your APIs, providing uh, an ability to view and uh, uh, you know try out your API contracts and your API documentation, uh, providing that self sign on. And at the same time, for your external users, providing that uh, ability to have uh, a security access control policies, all of the other things that you are used to in an API management paradigm. Okay, service mesh takes care of uh, the service to service interaction. It is more technical in construct. So uh, it is uh, about uh, delivering that advanced traffic control, security, uh, chaos testing, resilience, uh, observability for your cloud native apl applications across uh, uh, cross cutting uh, to through your business uh, business services. And uh, uh, what you need to do uh, is uh, there is an overlap uh, between uh, API management and service mesh in terms of some of the functionality they provide. So the idea is to use both of them efficiently in your microservice architecture. So like I said, with service mesh, uh, you are focusing more on uh, uh, you know, technical construct and communication between your uh, services uh, within, uh, you know, within a particular uh, uh, cluster or within a particular uh, bounded uh, context and providing that uh, ability to uh, connect and uh, communicate across services, get that observability, get that uh, you know, trusted, uh, secure uh, security using TLS or, uh, you know, the ability to uh, to uh, do traceability of your traffic across multiple services. Uh, whereas API management is to manage the relationship between API providers, consumers, more business construct, uh, more about providing uh, uh, business plans, billing, our uh, analytics, developer portal, and outreach. Uh, let me pause here for a bit. Hi, Rafael, uh, are you online now? Uh, 
Okay, uh, let me continue. Uh, Rafael, if you are online, uh, what we can do is uh, I could go through the presentation and then uh, we, you know, you could, uh, if you're online, we could have your uh, demo of the open banking uh, followed by uh, my demo that I wanted to do on the service mesh. So managing APIs for external consumers is what your API management is all about. It's outside of your enterprise boundary and you are packaging your backend APIs, backend technical endpoints, API endpoints into actual API products, API business uh, business products with uh, a proper uh, you know packaging of multiple backends to uh, to be a more uh, uh, you know more of a, uh, a, a more a group together as a, as a business service, maybe as a banking ecosystem, a payment gateway, or a distributed system with the allied backend services that are necessary, without your external uh, vendors. Or your external consumers being aware of what the complexity of your backend systems are or what the actual URL paths or the endpoints of your backend systems are. You would package it um, up into an API product, provide uh, to different audiences under different uh, uh, API plans and constraints, uh, and uh, you know, uh, different ability to build different consumers, uh, uh, you know, different um, different rates, and the ability to reach out to different consumers through different uh, uh, so uh, wherever the source of the API request comes from. So this is traditionally called uh, the API as a product approach, and this is uh, a way to manage. Uh, you know, when you're going from a traditional architecture to a more, uh, a more modern, uh, modern services-based architecture, the differentiation between uh, the backend services and the front-end APIs becomes important. You're now thinking not just about exposing a HTTP REST endpoint to your end users, but actually thinking about how can I package it as a business construct to to appeal to my business audiences and to uh, uh, you know to actually use uh, my API strategy to for my businesses. Now uh, the model. The model kind of breaks down when you're looking at an API mic uh, at a microservice architecture because it's more east-west in nature. It's more about uh, you know uh, 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 more about communication uh, through services that are not not necessarily having to be exposed externally, but uh, you know but but still need to be communicating with each other. Uh, you know maybe within the same bounded domain or across domains. And uh, certainly, the ability to have to scale to uh, thousands of APIs, uh, allowing for distributed tracing to work, uh, mutual TLS uh, in a zero trust security network to work, uh, having an allow list, a deny list, and uh, you know gives a more uh, uh, more of a flat uh, architecture pattern rather than the uh, you know API connectivity from outside your uh, organization, which is more of a north south model, and this is where a service mesh suits your needs. And so, when do you use API management, and when do you use service mesh? For your external facing uh, APIs that are going to be connected to out API consumers outside your enterprise boundary, uh, the uh, you know the logic is clear. You have your enterprise boundary and the uh, APIs uh, are managed through an API management, either as an API product or directly as an API backend, and uh, you are uh, letting API consumers access it as an API. So that's the traditional north-south management pattern. And then you simply use the east-west management pattern for managing uh, the microservice to microservice communication, uh, you know, for your uh, for building up your uh, service uh, architecture, the service connectivity, observability, traceability, and all the other uh, concerns that a microservice architecture provides. 
whereas it becomes a little bit more complex when you want to provide that sort of a, a boundary from uh, within the bounded domains as you did from the with the enterprise boundary so if you have microservices in different microservice groups and you want the uh, service as to service communication across the boundaries to happen in a more formal way uh, you know, through an application plan or through, uh, you know, maybe interdepartmental billing or through more formal sign up and, uh, you know, uh, application keys, uh, role based access control and things like that. Then what you need is even in your east west architecture, you need to introduce that uh, ability to provide, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the API management pattern within it. And that's where uh, things become. Uh, you know, things become a bit more complex. And so how do you actually secure and how do you distinguish this inter and intra domain traffic? So if it is hierarchical, it's north south, it's usually, you know, there will be a, a single entry point or a single gateway API. Uh, and, uh, you know, your uh, all the all the other services are kind of uh, uh, kind of managed and called through there. Uh, and there is an ability for you to think of differentiated roles for different consumer groups. Uh, providing authorization, authentication, more formal API contracts. People expect a open API spec or a document to be available and uh, an ability to, uh, to be uh, discoverable and provide uh, uh, formal sign-on and documentation through a developer portal. Whereas if your uh, service uh, services are connected more like a network of graphs, it, it's flat in nature, there is communication happening uh, to and from multiple services. There is a one is to one pattern here. Consumers are within the same bounded context, whether it is the same team or whether they're deploying within the same uh, container platform or within the, uh, within the same uh, uh, you know, cloud platform. You, you, your contracts are more implicit. Uh, you are you are catering to the developers accessing code uh, and interfaces developed by other developers. Your your communication flows through more lightweight HTTP two gRPC protocols rather than a formal HTTP and REST based protocol. And documentation of the services happens internally from within the code. So thinking about the security paradigms that are addressed by API management, uh, your authorization, authentication, rate limiting, and uh, layer seven security that uh, that is applicable at the gateway, like uh, you know SSL or uh, you know OAuth two and OpenID Connect, your token inspections, uh, and uh, any uh, uh, connectivity and policies based on the HTTP protocol, API management is more suitable in that place. And where you are uh, thinking about traffic control, uh, ingress into your Kubernetes cluster, providing destination rules uh, to uh, different microservice endpoints, uh, uh, multiple versions of your microservice running with uh, different uh, service architectures depending on different uh, uh, different version I version numbers, uh, whitelisting or blacklisting of uh, you know of services or uh, network uh, endpoints, and more of a lower level security. L4, but also a little bit L7 nowadays with service mesh, with mutual TLS, with ciphers, with load balancing, chaos testing, resilience. These are all the factors that you would look at when you're trying to build a, build a, uh, a service to service communication using service mesh. With API management, you have uh, uh, authentications uh, possible through either using a single key, which is called an API key, uh, you know, a, a key-based authentication, which is used most commonly across most uh, uh, public API providers, or an app ID and an app uh, key pair, uh, public and private secret based on uh, 
you know the uh, http auth and uh, and the most secure form is to use open id connect and uh, you know the ability to federate your identity management to a uh, to an identity and access provider and uh, to use the identity uh, 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 as a as an authorization token that is sent to your api gateway to then allow access to that particular uh, resource in terms of uh, access control then uh, you are looking at access control at two levels at uh, you know both the user level and at the application level at the application level it's about okay there is a client application that is going to call this api uh, am i going to allow that client application and what subset of my api what paths or what methods are they allowed to access that's about the application access control in terms of uh, uh, user access control you are trying to answer the question about okay there is an end user is he allowed to call this api or is he allowed access to this particular developer portal can he uh, try to manage his keys is he allowed to uh, sign up to this kind of a plan you know those are the kind of uh, 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 kind of uh, access control mechanisms that you need to put at the api access level at, as well as at the api documentation and api um, uh, api management level Okay, uh, I will go through this uh, particular service mesh use case as we do the demo. Uh, now, let me pause here for, uh, for a second. And uh, hi, uh, Rafael, uh, are you here? Can you, can you share your screen? Yeah. 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 So I, I guess you had some internet problems, right? Actually, uh, I just discovered that there was two sessions for, for Red Hat. So I did the first half of the presentation in another session, and you just delivered the other part. So wow. I'm sorry okay. for the attendees, but yeah. OK, so we do we have uh, two parallel sessions running as a booth. OK, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I was here. I was wondering, you know, so there was something. <laughs> so sorry about. That. I think it was something we need to sort out with the API days team. But exactly. uh, but sorry, I uh, I moved ahead uh, to uh, talk over you. But do you want to do your uh, uh, demo? Uh, of oh your, yeah, I can uh, I can show you, show again. So I I think you delivered the first part of the slides, yes. right? Yes, I did. Yeah. Let me share the screen. So, so what I, I want to do is to 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 show very quickly. So let me look out from looking. Oops. Let's make sure. Uh, what I want will do is very quickly show uh, the outside in view of the uh, core banking APIs or the banking APIs access. Uh, so you can have any kind of uh, external API, act, open API provided, maybe it be uh, a standard API as part of uh, a regular consumer data sharing uh, framework like open finance or it, you can also have uh, partner apis where you are redefining the value chain and relying on on hiring uh, business module banking modules from external parties or uh, your digital channels apis right so you need to in any form provide access to uh, to a open to a developer portal with an API catalog, and this is what we can we get out of the Open API Sandbox uh, toolkit that we uh, at Red Hat we develop. And as part of this toolkit, there are a set of API prefabricated APIs from Open Bank Open Banking in UK, uh, which are responding with uh, market market data so let's let me show you the personal current account 
you can explore and then you see the, all the documentation from the API spec uh, as, as, as you could, uh, could expect from the open banking standard. And then you, I can use the API key to try out this API out from this browser. Uh, and we'll get the result over here. So you see on the response, many personal accounts that are available from this bank. And I can do very, it's similar using uh, command line. So I can really go over here and use core and the provided snippet to to make an API call and then we get similar results uh, for the personal accounts API. And in fact, this is all living in the uh, Treescale API management platform running on top of OpenShift and back it with the support of MicroRocks to serve as the mock endpoints. So the personal current account and the many other APIs are available over here. We can really quickly navigate through the, see the, the API, the, how it's connected to the backend. And as you can see, there is this, that is pointing out to a backend URL uh, internally in the, the OpenShift cluster, but also we can check the traffic and how many APIs calls we are getting today uh, into the average and different kind of uh, statistics analytics, analytics uh, controls in this in this uh, in the API management platform and many other tools like the Active Docs for putting the API documentation that is imported from the developer portal and do all the controls but more importantly is that the open api sandbox toolkit provision all the, the these capabilities out of the box uh in the OpenShift cluster and this is my OpenShift cluster where i want to show very quickly the capability that we use from uh from the tree scale, the ability to deploy APIs, APIs using custom resource definitions. And if you look into the product personal current account API, you, you see that there is a YAML file defining all the product API that is deployed through this through the system. So that means that it could be embedded into the delivery pipeline. Uh, and then I'll, I can show you also that uh, the MicroOx backend. So there are the, these multiple API endpoints, backend endpoints, are really uh, market data imported as imported collections over here. And as you can see, the results of these API endpoints is really the same content I provided as part of this uh, market data. So this engine uh, allows many other type of controls and logic. So you can make some contr flow controls uh, to the API endpoints. But this is really what I want to show as part of the demo. Stop here. Great, great. Uh, thank, thanks, Rafael. Um, so uh, do you know if uh, everyone has moved to this particular uh, uh, stream or do we still have people well, listening when i get notes yeah when i get notice i i i did inform people to join of the other session here so, okay yes. oh, hopefully hopefully that's <laughs> okay this never happened before when we ran it uh, last year or yeah. in singapore so yeah something strange 
uh, very quickly, let me uh, now share my screen. And uh, we have eight minutes left. But what I wanted to do was also showcase a similar use case that uh, R R R that Rafael showed. And uh, I have what I have also done is uh, you know used Ansible and kind of uh, provision this kind of environment available out of the box for you to use uh, to quickly showcase hey, how is service mesh, how does, uh, you know, your API management work and how do they both work together, you know, a simple, uh, simple example of a microservice and a simple layering of uh, three scale API management on top to, uh, to provide the connectivity. What you see here is uh, a traditional service mesh use case. So it works through the Istio Ingress Envoy uh, to the uh, API, uh, to the service, uh, to the backend service. Uh, and uh, there are uh, envoys uh, that are deployed along with each of those particular uh, backend services that allow you to then set up that service mesh, uh, uh, which is controlled through the Istio control plane and the ability for you to have that uh, connectivity. So if you uh, see this here, what I have uh, is uh, that particular uh, example of that uh, of the solution that I uh, that I have provided. And uh, I uh, what uh, so when you provision this particular environment out of the box, you also get a set of uh, instructions in how to uh, showcase and run this demo. So uh, what you would see here is uh, how the particular connectivity works from your API consumers and your API applications, how it progresses through your Istio ingress to your backend service. And uh, on the Istio control plane, uh, what Red Hat provides you is with a, with an Istio plugin and it works through the mixer component right now uh, on service mesh 2.0. But with service mesh 2.1, it will be working through the WASM interface. And what that would do is it will plug in your whole uh, three scale API management uh, uh, capabilities like rate limiting and security directly into your Istio control plane. With Istio, what you get is, uh, let me run some sample commands uh, just so that there is some uh, traffic that is generated. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, so let's. Let's see the traffic being generated. And Kiali is kind of, uh, you know, the uh, basically a management console to your service mesh. So if you look at Kiali, what you can see is uh, the different microservices that are running, namespaces that they're running under, the health of each of those services, uh, you know, the, and you can dig more into details of, uh, you know, the, the versions of it, any annotations you put any traffic uh, that uh, that has been generated onto these services. And what you can also visualize is how the traffic uh, flows between uh, your, as it hits the Istio ingress and to your, uh, to your service, how the communication happens to the different backend services. If you look at the north-south architecture that I talked about, the one is to end uh, uh, you know, architecture of microservice, you find this is exactly the same uh, uh, paradigm, right? You have a product page uh, 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 microservice and that acts as an orchestrator of the other uh, microservices, the detail service, the review service, and the rating service, and kind of pulls uh, all of them together and presents, uh, you know, a coherent response back to the caller. What you can also see is uh, with Jaeger uh, is that uh, distributed tracing functionality. So an ability for you to actually do the traces and see how the uh, the traffic has flown from uh, each of those uh, services uh, and uh, you know the advantage that this gives you is that it exactly shows you uh, how much uh, time is spent in each of those uh, layers and uh, you know and if you su suspect uh, there is uh, an additional layer that is being introduced what is happening there from three scale, what I have done is I've actually set up uh, this particular uh, endpoint um, uh, as a as a product API product. Uh, so if you see my three scale, uh, I have uh, my book info API product. 
Uh, what this does is it is configured uh, to the uh, to the Istio backend gateway, and uh, I use uh, a front end of uh, a, a, an API uh, gateway layer, an Nginx gateway layer, and I have set up uh, application plans. So I have two plans. I have a basic plan and a premium plan. And uh, on a basic plan, what I have done is I have put rate limiting that they can access the API, but not the product page endpoint. So if you see that working here, uh, if I use the uh, API key for uh, the particular uh, uh, um, for that particular user uh, for the basic user and try to access you know if i access the api it works fine uh, whereas if i try to access the page the product page provides me an authentication field so this way what i'm able to do is i could use uh, api management to provide me with that uh, you know that capability to provide uh, application plans and introduce rate limiting i could introduce the uh, pricing metering billing all the other functionality that an api management platform provides me with i could plug it into istio uh, and uh, what you could also do and i think we're just running out of time so i would not be able to showcase it but the the solution is available as a video uh, on our uh, red hat middleware youtube channel but what you could see is uh, 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 you know now we have uh, the uh, gateway and the istio as two different ingress points but using the istio adapter you could actually have that connectivity flowing uh, through the istio adapter uh, through the istio mixer and directly uh, plugging in the three scale authentication into uh, into your service mesh itself Okay, and uh, so if we have only two minutes left, so let me just uh, stop sharing here. And uh, I hope you found this useful. We have uh, a minute or two to wrap up, but uh, do check out uh, the resources at the Red Hat booth. We have uh, a lot of resources, both on banking as well as uh, service mesh and API management, including an ebook. Uh, and also tomorrow is Rafael's session on open banking. Uh, you should check it out. Thank you, everyone, and I apologize, apologize for 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 the two duplicate session. Yeah, sorry about that. It never happened, but we will take it up with the uh, organizing. Thank team. you, Sacha. Yeah, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Rafael.